Hello, San Bernardino. Welcome to episode five of Everything San Bernardino Real Estate. I'm Robert Carrillo, joined by Yvette Romero. Today, we dive into the Wellness Fund Grant Program. Welcome, if you're tuning in for the first time from the Instagram Reel. The Wellness Fund Grant Program, and I'm quoting here, financially supports pre-development and innovative housing construction costs for low to moderate income households and unhoused neighbors, thanks to a grant from Kaiser Permanente. In this episode, we are going to discuss at length our response to the request for proposals, the Launchpad. So let's start with your real estate background, Rob, and how the Wellness Fund aligns with your vision. I've been involved in some facet of real estate over 25 years, including commercial real estate brokerage, affordable housing development, and management. I've been a student of real estate just as long, and one of the concepts that's fascinated me, that's impacted me, and impacted my communities is gentrification. Gentrification means a lot of different things to different people. While gentrification brings with it improved infrastructure, better food and retail options, and improved real estate values, which everyone wants, by definition, it also displaces poorer residents, usually black and brown folk. And that's my issue with gentrification. And it's personal to me. I couldn't live in the hood that I grew up in, Washington Heights, post-college. I just couldn't afford it. Right? I grew up in the crack 80s, needles and vials on my path to school, shootouts. And in the late 90s, I couldn't afford to live there. I'd go back when I could and visit my mom, um, who was still living there in a rent-controlled apartment. But because I had a good job, I could go eat in the Heights and things of that nature. But it wasn't the same. It wasn't home. And that feeling of not being home was felt by a lot of longtime residents, including my mom. Right. The neighborhood was changing. And yes, there were less drugs in the main streets, which is better for everyone. And the streets were cleaner, too. But the existing residents, they didn't and couldn't frequent the new stores. Right. Those new stores, those new establishments weren't built for them. So those two types of displacements, right, the being booted from the neighborhood and then the social internal displacement are my issues with gentrification. And we talk about gentrification in a lot of different places. We had interns uh, do research on gentrification, and they came up with gentrification happening in cities all out, all throughout the U.S., um, even Europe. If you Google where is gentrification happening, you'll get lots of hits. Usually when people talk about gentrification in their hoods, it's already too late in the gentrification process, right? Some folks think that when the coffee shop finally shows up, that gentrification is finally there. Actually, the process had long started before the cafe opened up. Um, and so the cafe shows that gentrification happened there, right? It's already a foregone conclusion. And so I read a lot about community development, economic development, um, what works in some cities, what's been tried and failed. And there are many, many, many people um, really throughout the world and organizations combating gentrification in their way. And when people talk about gentrification, they usually talk about it from a housing perspective and not the impact of gentrification on small businesses and enterprises, right? That's one of the things. So when people talk about gentrification, usually they, um, and I'm talking about the ones who push for it because of all the good that comes with it, they don't talk about the displacement and the brain drain that accompanies that displacement. So last year you were part of a program right here in San Bernardino called Recast Your City. I know you've been part of other fellowships or programs that have to do with economic development or housing or nonprofit development in New York. How have those experiences shaped your view of gentrification or how to combat gentrification? Yeah, good question, right? Those experiences and lessons combined with my involvement in different facets of real estate, right? From commercial to residential, affordable housing to business development. And because I've been active as a community organizer or activist, really anywhere that I've lived, and of course, with my involvement in youth development, all of that has given me a unique lens, if you will, from which I view real estate. Not just real estate, but real estate development, community development, and economic development. And in my opinion, the number one way to combat gentrification, to avoid that displacement, is through ownership of homes, businesses, and commercial property. And of course, you got to couple that with an 
array or an offering of a range of mixed income, non-market rate housing and rentals that provide a pathway to ownership. And then you've got to add jobs, job training and small business incubation. And then I'd say lastly, for neighborhoods and communities, it's combining all of those elements under one roof or a set of roofs, if you will, through mixed use development. So I've noticed mixed use development has been coming up in a lot of conversations lately at a lot of community meetings in the news. Developers are now talking about it. But I've got to say, I remember you talking about mixed use um, being the answer to gentrification a couple of years ago. Yo, did you know that it is expensive to build what's dubbed as affordable housing? You can find affordable housing development projects that are taking place right now that cost more than market rate housing to develop. Like how preposterous is that? I spent valuable time in the affordable housing space in New York. First of tax credit funding, which is the most common way equity is funded in affordable housing developments is crazy expensive. There are fees, layers of fees, sponsorships, fees for those sponsorships, a lot of red tape, which adds a lot of time. And of course, time is money. Affordable housing really at the end of the day is only affordable to the residents that live there, right? The developments, they cost a lot, right? You gotta go through a lot of subsidies. You gotta find a lot of different equity injection points. And then once a building is up, operating expenses usually are the killer for affordable housing, right? The cost of utilities, um, heating, water, electric, right? Nowadays you have to add insurance to that. And then of course, the affordable housing development projects, they get tax breaks which unfortunately is not something that our community needs. We, we need a tax base, right? Again, how preposterous is it that we're going to build affordable housing um, in a place, but then as simultaneously take away a tax base that is going to help the community, right? And because it's expensive on those fronts, um, you know, get, uh, making them sustainable is is hard because that's a higher upfront cost usually, right? And so these low-income housing tax credit units are meant to be affordable for a minimum of 30 years. Right? It used to be 15, 30 years. Some places are pushing for 40 years. Uh, you've got some places that can do 99 years. But if you're not at market, if you're not getting the income and being able to raise the rent on a regular basis, enough to cover the rising costs, then you're going to have deferred maintenance. You're going to have buildings that after their 30-year affordability term are going to have to be sold to private developers and private landlords who can then afford to rehab and get market rates um, for those properties, right? So that, that affordable housing, right, goes by the wayside after 30 years, typically. And the way, I guess, affordable housing is built the way it's organized, the way it's structured, to me, the, the way it's set up, it's meant to keep, to keep folks living in affordable housing. It's kind of twisted the way that works. And it's also one of the reasons why people, uh, a lot of people have this NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard sort of um, uh, feeling towards affordable or what's dubbed again as affordable housing. And you have a way to turn those folks into Yimby? <laughs> uh, yes, right? And that's why I'm excited to present the launch pad. And the launch pad is aptly named because a launch pad uh, is a symbol and is associated with new beginnings, takeoffs, and the initiation, if you will, of journeys, right? So we're taking a vacant lot in a commercial strip. And we're all too familiar with the vacant lots on commercial strips in San Bernardino, and we're turning it into a hub of economic, social, communal, and cultural activity, right? The launch pad will provide space where ideas, where businesses, and where ventures can take off and thrive, right? Again, the launch pad. And it's not just a development, really. It's a catalyst for what I think can be positive change and really what could be a model for the rest of San Bernardino or for San Bernardino at large. There are enough lots in San Bernardino where this model can work. It can be scaled up or even down, believe it, right? So what is it? The launch pad is a mixed use development constructed of 70 recycled shipping containers. It'll be all electric, solar powered, energy and water efficient. It'll have multiple drought 
um, resistant green spaces, meeting spaces, and eating spaces, bike parking, and two EV charging stations, right? And if you don't know about shipping containers as mixed-use developments, Google shipping containers for mixed-use development and click images. We are changing how real estate will be done in San Bernardino. Right. The ground floor consists of small-scale manufacturing spaces, retail incubator spaces, and commercial kitchens to help new and growing entrepreneurs scale their businesses. I've helped small businesses find space and grow their business for over 20 years in New York and in the IE the past couple of years. This, what we're doing with the launch pad, is next level. We're talking about having brand new turnkey spaces where entrepreneurs can test, launch, and then scale their businesses, right? And they're not going at it alone. This is the best part of it. They're gonna get guidance from the best small business and entrepreneur resource organization that I know of in the IE, Asociación de Emprendedores. If you're dreaming of starting your own business, you have to get with them, right? They know what's going on. They'll take your project, you know, start you from beginning to end. But a project of this importance, of this magnitude has to include community partners, right, who share the same mission, who share the same passion. Now, I envision in that commercial space a place where businesses can incubate, if you will, for two to three years and then graduate to bigger spaces. And in their three to five year plan, they're figuring out how to own the property for their business, right? I'm telling you, ownership is the way to combat gentrification. And again, a project of this magnitude, when outside developers see that this can work, that it pencils out because it does, and you know, we basically... Uh, in a way, are helping boost gentrification, right? Which is kind of ill the way that works. But as we're helping to elevate things, other folks are going to come in and try and do this, and they will, but for at market rates, right? But anyway, continuing with the launch pad, right? The commercial kitchens, the ground floor will have commercial kitchens, multiple shipping containers are perfect for outfitting um, kitchens. So we're going to get a handful of kitchens in there, different foods, different kitchen types with outdoor dining areas. And we're getting a shipping container farm that can produce about two acres of produce in one year, right? So we'll be food producing, food making, making, catering, and dining center. And the ground floor basically will be the economic activity hub for folks and entrepreneurs to launch businesses. The second floor is going to consist of eight apartments for very low to moderate income level households, including at least 25 percent, or in this case, two of the units um, designated for our, our unhoused neighbors. And this is quality housing. Right? We're not building any Class C type properties. This is quality housing that folks are going to be proud of, that neighbors are going to be proud of. We're going to have three studios. We're going to have two one-bedroom apartments, two two-bedroom apartments, and a three-bedroom apartment. They're all electric, water-efficient um, fixtures. There's going to be an elevator. Right, So basically for all abilities, we're going to have a state-of-the-art laundry room for residents only two meeting rooms where residents can get services, job training, social services, and home ed education. I'm telling you, this is a launch pad for a reason. And we're bringing in neighborhood partnership, um, housing services. Those are the folks who've been helping create affordable housing and help people get into home ownership for 30 years. They'll be helping those residents with their home ownership dreams. And right now, right, we're labeling these as rentals but as we navigate this process and as we get more resources and more support for it, we really want to take this model model to another level. I think that we can make resi a residential, the residential component into a co-op housing um, and environment instead of renting, right? Folks need to own and we can make these limited equity co-ops, right? To sort of keep them affordable or we can allow for the folks who live there to gain the equity as the market changes. Again, we're trying to combat gentrification. To me, the way to do that, the way to get people out of poverty, the way to break that cycle is through ownership, right? And so, of course, we're going to be partnering up with the Uplift San Bernardino without a doubt, right? Um, that's a given. We're going to be working with them, again, to get services, D-Right services to the residents of these buildings. 
and or at least of the residents of the launch pad. And of course, after that, we're going to be going and trying to reach out to all the city council folks, um, especially the city council person in this particular ward. And it'd be crazy for them to not want to participate in something of this magnitude. So you've been orchestrating this project for a while and people will want to know, do the numbers work? You mentioned, right? It does pencil out. And um, that is, does the income that can be derived from the project support what it costs to develop and operate? Yep. The numbers work. This is a profitable project, even though it's going to have this non-market rate housing component attached, right? We're changing the term affordable too. We're going with non-market rate housing, right? For a for-profit developer, which technically we are, uh, can take this model and do what we're doing. But instead of putting the affordable units up there or the non-market rate units up there, they can put market rates. For us, the ground floor commercial space subsidizes the non-market rents above. For a for-profit developer, the apartments above are just going to be that much more extra profit um, for them, ultimately. So the commercial rents would support upper floor rents and then in what were once vacant lots. Yes. Right. So getting above market rents on the ground floor is a function of two things, really. One is that these spaces are considered micro spaces because they'll range from 240 square feet on the small end to 900 square feet at most on the high end. Right. And so the smaller square footage means you can pay or rather get a higher per square foot rent. Because we're delivering turnkey um, retail locations and small scale manufacturing spaces, we can actually charge a premium on a per square foot basis. But because the spaces are so small, they can still be affordable to new businesses, right? And the second thing is that we're creating a built in audience, right? If you will, a built in um, consumer base for their store, right? In this case, the residents above. Uh, and in this case, for the launch pad, it's not just going to be the eight units above, right? We are situated uh, near a residential neighborhood. But the idea when you scale up is that the units above can support the businesses below and sort of vice versa. And so I mentioned how expensive it is to build, again, as it's dubbed affordable housing because of all the co costs associated with it. Well, by building with shipping containers and by incorporating this market rate commercial space, we reduce the development cost and increase the operating income. So the numbers per pencil out for non-market rate um, units, even without um, government subsidies. So it's a win-win. So how much will it cost and how is the launch pad going to get paid for? Yep. The development cost is four and a half million dollars. And really, that's around what it would cost to only build eight affordable units without a commercial component, even if it qualifies for tax credit. That's how expensive it is to build affordable housing. Right. And so one, I think this thing can be funded easily. Um, didn't San Bernardino lose out almost five million dollars last year for failing to do something with the housing plan? Well, this thing could have been funded with that money straight up, right? But at the very least, we need to come up with, I'd say, half of the development costs in the form of equity. If we are able to do that, the other half we'll get um, in the form of a loan. So at the bare minimum, half of this 4.5 is $2.25 million in cash and equity. And that can come in the form of grants, forgivable loans and equity. And of course, then the other half, which is the loan, makes the deal more expensive. It reduces the, the net cash flow, but it's still profitable in the end, even if it's just a lot less profitable. So right now we've connected with an entity uh, and are exploring tokenization options, all right, or the ability to create fractional shares so that just about anyone in the community can own an actual part of the launch pad, yo, right? How cool would that be if the community could actually own a part of this thing, get dividends, right? To me, that's community reinvestment, economic development. Um, I'd love to put this in a community land trust, but I'll admit that even though while I've read up on it and I, I feel like it's definitely one way to maintain affordability in some places, I think it's a long process. And right now, I think, especially here in San Bernardino, because of the opportunities, uh, we have to strike while the iron is hot. So you need developers kind of like us who are thinking about the community and how to make this thing affordable for the community. I think if developers did that, 
there'll be a lot less need, if you will, for the government subsidies, um, uh, the tax credits rather, again, which make these things a lot more ex um, expensive. So this is a model for building quality, right? That's the key word to me too, is because folks will say, oh, we'll throw out, you know, we'll, we'll provide again, this affordable housing, but it looks like it's built affordably, right? So we're going to create quality non-market rate housing at non-exuberant costs. Right, where you can bypass the tax breaks, which is something our community needs. Right, we don't need more tax breaks, we actually need more tax base, and so we bypass some of those costs that are normally associated with tax credit housing. Right, the launch pad will be launched straight up, and so with the wellness fund pre development grant money, what we can do is complete a thorough site analysis, right, to make sure that what we can build can I mean, what we want to build can actually build, be built there. Um, get detailed construction estimates, right? So that when we go to uh, raise the money and actually meet with the lenders, we we have the exact cost, right? We know what we what we're doing, and then we can get detailed construction estimates for that purpose, and get the next level of renderings and floor plans, so we can make our case again to the powers that be, whether those are lenders, government entities, elected officials, grant makers. So I think that we, as a community, right now, as community-minded folks, can take this model, build on it, scale it, and, and really use it to build up our city. And I, I firmly, firmly believe that this is a model and that, that's that's what we, we're going all in on this. That, our people, is the launch pad. It is part of the Wellness Fund Grant Program Competition. So vote yes to get this project funded. If you're interested in learning more and being part of this real estate and community development revolution, because that's really what it is, turning the way real estate has been done on its head, reach out to us, call us, or visit our office. We are Cario Group C and Y, where we do real estate with purpose.